Really appreciate you all being here today. And for those of you who are familiar with some of our tradition here around the Christmas season, we actually spend the month of December looking into the Christmas story. And so this morning we're doing that uh, again. And you might wonder about that because there's not that many verses in the Bible that share the Christmas story. But it is true that they are so incredibly filled with depth and richness. You could probably preach on them every single Sunday for a year and not exhaust uh, their incredible depth. We're in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, and uh, there's a mic that needs to be shut off to uh, limit this feedback. Thank you. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. He gives two pictures of a season of great rejoicing. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called, let's all read the rest of this slide together, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government in peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. There certainly has been an ongoing commercialization of this holy day, and you've probably noticed a secularization of this holy day. And a lot of people are afraid that the true meaning of Christmas is being lost if it hasn't been lost already. You probably remember a couple of years ago there was great controversy about a particular coffee establishment they were accused of having anti-Christmas cups. Actually, they were just plain red cups, but because they didn't put any holiday symbolism on it, some people thought they were making a statement. Just so you know, I don't think it's the job of a coffee company to proclaim the good news of the birth of Christ, or of our government for that matter either. I think that privilege belongs to our families and to the family of God. You probably will find a lot less religious symbolism in the images this holy day. But the true meaning of Christmas can actually be found in many of the activities that we participate in. For, the, for example, where did the idea come of putting up lights in the dark come from? Where did the idea of giving and receiving gifts come from? The truth is, that those of us who have accepted the gift of God's Son into our lives don't see the Christmas story the same way everyone else does. Certainly not the way others who have received grace. And there are some people who get frustrated that the nativity scenes and religious symbols are being reduced or eliminated from public environments. And what I want you to know this morning, I'm surprised they were ever allowed because this is what's true. We, those of us who, who know the Christmas story and have accepted grace, we see this very differently. But you have to know that the Christmas story can be very, very offensive. The passage that we just read today can really frustrate people. You see, we put lights on trees. Uh, in our house, our children developed a dislike for helping me light the tree. They still talk about it. If, you, if, if they are home and I say, would you like to help me light the tree, they break out in a cold sweat. 
And it's not because uh, they had to do that much. In fact, it was how little they had to do that frustrated them more than anything else. They held the strands of lights and followed me around the tree. And, and I wasn't the kind of person who would just throw the lights on the tree or just ring the tree. We had to go in and out of every little branch. And uh, that could take a while. And uh, they still have uh, painful memories associated with that. We put lights in our houses. We put candles in the windows. And these lights are beautiful, and they hold an incredibly deep meaning. Christmas reminds us that the world is a dark place. And it is. Our world is not shed abroad in light, but it hides deep darkness, and Christmas reminds us that until the light comes, we cannot find our way. And that's what frustrates some people. If someone accuses you of being in the dark, you never consider that a compliment. It's only when someone tells us that we're bright or we're enlightened that we realize that they're saying something nice. Being in the dark or living in darkness indicates that there's something potentially wicked or evil that's going on. Those were dark times. That's what they usually mean. It suggests that there's a lack of knowledge. They were in the dark about something. It suggests blindness, not just physical blindness, but a spiritual blindness. It suggests that there's something that's unhealthy within our nature or our personality because people will talk about when their, their thoughts became dark. Our world is filled full of violence and abuse of power and poverty and oppression and greed and terror. And you should know this is not new to our world. We might be freshly aware of it, but it has been so since the very first family. Of course, there's hope that we will figure out our problems. And we're told this, if we just work together, if we would just all get on the same page, then we can bring peace to any conflict and, and we can outlaw destructive behavior. And, and if we work together and we come together, then we can make this world a better place. And, and there's so much of that sentimentality that especially gets spoken this time of year. So we're constantly surprised when we bring our very brightest minds together and they don't seem to be able to resolve our problems. And we pour incredible resources into things and we don't seem to be able to resolve our problems. The same science that we use to extend life and to save life can be used to take life because there are weapons of incredible destruction. And the same technology that uses to connect us can be used to target us. And so we're troubled. And we think if everybody would just have good intentions, you have to realize good intentions do not remove bad intentions. It just creates more conflict. The simple truth is, we need something far more than science and technology to save us. Please don't misunderstand this. This is not an anti-science or anti-technology talk. There's far too many religious voices that speak against those things as though they are the source of our problems. They do not. They are not the source of our problems. It's just the more we look at them for our salvation, the more we realize how incredibly darkened our hearts are and our world is. If we're just here by accident, if certain atoms happen to collide at just the right time and just the right place so that we would eventually become this, then there really is no vision of what we were supposed to be or purpose assigned to it. And life without purpose is not very enjoyable. If that's true, then our only real goal is just to survive as long as we can and reproduce as much as we can. And if there's nothing beyond the grave, then what hope is there? Those that we've lost, we'll never see again. And once we're gone, there'll be nothing left. This is the darkness our world sits in. But the Christmas story, while it tells us that it is a dark world, it also tells us that there's reason to hope. A light has dawned. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, I love the language there because it reminds us of the light of the sun. When you use the word dawn, it reminds us of the light of the sun. And here's the thing. How many are enjoying all the sunlight today? How many is responsible for that sunlight today? You, you turned the sun on. We, none of us did. And you know what else? If for any reason the sun ceased to shine, then all life on this planet would cease to exist. 
We can enjoy the light, and we can walk in it, but we don't create it. Isaiah uses this concept of a dawning light that comes upon us. It reminds us that there's an external light that we have no control over or cause. We didn't cause to happen, but we benefit from it. We don't cause the sun to shine, and we don't cause God's light to shine in our life. And without that external source of light, then we cease to exist. The light that Isaiah refers to is far more than just the sun. Just as surely as the sunlight reveals the truth of what exists in our world, God's word is the truth that reveals what exists in our heart. And that is something we're not always comfortable with. Now, sunrises and sunsets are beautiful. I see lots of pictures of them on line all the time, and uh, I've taken many pictures of sunrises and sunsets myself. And while they are always beautiful, it is also true that the light that they shed doesn't always reveal beautiful things. The light of God's word, well, it exposes some of our hopelessness. It exposes some of our addictions. It exposes some of our unhealthy desires. It exposes our discontent. It exposes our spiritual death. And people are not comfortable with that. So you can see how offensive the Christmas story can be. And what is this light that has dawned? Isaiah reveals the answer. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The child is revealed to be the mighty God and the everlasting Father. If this baby born in Bethlehem is actually the mighty God and the everlasting Father, then we cannot ignore him. If he's just a fable, if he's just a story, if he's just an inspirational figure out of history, then he doesn't much matter other than the retelling of the tale so that we all feel slightly better this time of year. But if he really is the mighty God, if he really is the everlasting Father, how can you ignore him? And by the way, when Jesus walked the earth, nobody did. They either hated him and tried to kill him, or they loved him and they worshipped him, but there was nobody that ignored him. If he really is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, he cannot be ignored. And if he really is the wonderful counselor and prince of peace, then he is someone who actually understands us. This is fascinating, that Jesus was born into poverty, and so he understands the challenges of the poor. He was threatened and he was beaten, so he knows what pain is like. Jesus was a, abandoned by his very closest friends, so he understands betrayal. Jesus was accused falsely and found guilty of crimes he did not commit. So Jesus understands injustice. The simple truth is, no matter what you face in your life, God understands. And God doesn't just claim to understand because he created us. He claims to understand because he became one of us. Now, when you see the love of God, that's when the light of God is beginning to dawn on you. Until you see the love of God, it's still just darkness. It's still just darkness. Because when you begin to see the love of God, you begin to see the truth about him. There are lots of people who have this view of God. He's just so angry. He's looking for any reason to pick a fight with someone, to put them down, to eliminate them, or to punish them, to cause pain in their lives. And people who, who don't even show up in religious environments will often say things like, I wonder what it is that I did in my life that caused God to want to do this to me. And what I want you to know is when we think like that, it reveals that we're still sitting in a great darkness. The Bible tells us what the overriding and sole motivation that God has for us is, for our entire world, for God so loved the world. You want to know what drives the motives of, heart of God? You want to know the motives of his heart? You want to know what drives all of his actions, all of his responses, all of his language, and all of his behavior? It's one word. It's love. And we begin to understand that. We begin to see him for who he is. But it's also true that we begin to see ourselves for who we are. When the light comes on, it's just what it is. Um, I can remember my sister getting a little makeup mirror, and you could change the light. It was this little slider, and it was everything from daylight to dim light. 
And I guess the makeup you put on should be dependent on the light you're going to be in. And some of us realize that different lights cause us to look differently. And it does. The light of God, it shows us the truth about him, but it also shows us the truth about ourselves. It shows us that we actually are spiritually dead and we are spiritually blind. And we tend to use things in this world to try to help make us feel like we have meaning or feel secure. If I just have more money, I would be more secure. If I just had more resources, then I would be more important and significant in life. If I just had more friends, then I would be better connected and I would feel more important. If I just had a position of power, then people would see me differently. And we keep using all of these things in life to try to make us feel more significant and make us feel more secure. But the pursuit of those things without spiritual light actually just leads to greater darkness. It reveals how great the darkness is in us. So it's the love of God that changes everything. And it tells us that a son is given. You see, the Son of God is the gift of God. The Son of God is the gift of God. And here's the thing. To receive a gift means that you have to acknowledge something. Right? To receive God's gift means that you have to acknowledge you need his gift. Now, I don't know, did anybody in this place ever get a gift you didn't want? I used to have an aunt who every year would buy me a record album of music that her generation liked. <laughs> Sometimes I never even bothered to open it because I knew this was not going to go well. Or how many have ever gotten a gift and you wondered what message they're trying to send you? You ever get one of those gifts? How about this? Overcoming anger and irritability, a self-help guide. If you get that, wouldn't you wonder? Wonder was, or how about this gift? <laughs> Maybe they're trying to tell you something. Or how about this gift? Etiquette. Manners for a new world. Even worse when it comes from your mother-in-law. That says something. Or Nutrisystem, lose up to seven pounds in two weeks. I mean, when you open that up, don't you go, hmm. Or home drug test. What are they trying to say? When we accept the gift of God, we accept something that he's telling us. And that's hard for some of us to accept. This is why it's so hard for so many people to receive grace. Because the grace of God assaults and attacks our pride. It tells us, the Christmas story reveals to us, it reminds us that I am so lost, I cannot save myself. It reminds us that I am such a sinner that even if I do good the rest of my life, it doesn't balance out the scales. It actually requires the death of the perfect Son of God to erase my sins. The Christmas story suggests that I have to surrender trying to run my life to allowing God to lead my life. And that, that frustrates a lot of people. So when you trim your tree this year, notice the lights. And when you drive through the neighborhoods at night, notice the lights because they're everywhere. Darkness has been invaded by grace. God has not left us alone. He has come to us. Unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. Sometimes that darkness comes in the form of unforgiveness. And our assumption is, is that until a person apologizes, we're stuck in life. And God wants to shed his light on that and let us know that there's forgiveness from him. It's more important than forgiveness we will get from anybody else. Sometimes our darkness is a grief, the assumption that the pain in my heart cannot be healed and it cannot be comforted. Or sometimes the darkness is a regret and a shame 
which is an assumption that you will be forever defined by your past behavior. Or our darkness can be a fear in which we assume that only bad things are going to happen to us. Or impatience, where our assumption is, I cannot be happy if I have to wait. Or selfishness, which says I cannot be happy if I don't get what I want. And what God wants us to know is those of us who are sitting in such a great darkness, the light is dawning on us. A gift that has been hidden, maybe from our view, for so long is now available. And the question is, are you ready, ready to receive it? Are you willing to receive him? Let's bow our heads this morning. You might be here this morning, and while I was talking, God was speaking to you. And you realized that while you've been exposed to grace, you haven't actually received it or accepted it. And so what I want you to know is there's no hoop to jump through. There's no religious ritual you have to fulfill. It's just a willingness to open this incredible gift and receive what God has for you, his very best. It's all he's ever wanted for anybody in this room and anyone in this world. It doesn't matter what portion of the world you've come from, how much you have or you don't consistent thing about God is his love for anyone who's been created in his image and likeness and you have so I'm going to ask this morning if you are interested in receiving this gift maybe this is something you realize that hasn't happened in your life then I'm going to start over here by the wall side the lobby side of our auditorium and I'm going to work my way through to every section until I get to the window side of our auditorium and if you want to receive this gift, I'm just going to ask you to lift up your eyes and look right at me and make sure I catch your attention today. And what I want you to know is uh, I'm not trying to prove anything to anyone, but I think it would be astonishing if God's grace would be shed abroad in your heart today and you would discover how truly good he is. So I'm over in this section by the lobby, and uh, if you would like to receive that gift today, just look right at me. I see you. I see you. Just anyone else, just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. I'm in the next section over. Anyone here that would like to accept that amazing gift of grace today, just look right at me. I see you. I see you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just keep looking right at me. I'm in the next section over. If you'd like to receive that today, thank you. I see you. Anyone else? Just thank you. I see you. Anyone else? And then the last section by the windows, just look right at me. Thank you. I see you. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, we have been sitting in such a great darkness, and our world is lost in it. It's caused us to be very afraid. It has revealed actions and behaviors and motives that we're not proud of. But for reasons we cannot explain, rather than be angry at us, you come to us and you shine a light upon us. Unto us a son is given. So, Father, I ask that you would help every single person in this room today, especially those who lifted their eyes to freshly receive the grace that you offer, the forgiveness of all of our faults and our failures, and the knowledge that we will never know a single moment apart from you, that your wisdom will lead us and your grace will sustain us and your spirit will abide in us. 
And not only have you come to shed your light on us, you want to show your light through us. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning?